an expensive watch can also be made in carbon. How can this watch with $180,000 be a competitor from an Apple watch? You can only do it if you think out of the box. Good afternoon, and thank you very much for joining us today on our uh, Learning from Leader series. Today, we have the immense privilege to welcome Jean-Claude Biver and Mr. Peter Van Am, author of Before I Was a CEO. I'm really looking forward to hearing all about your experience, Mr. Biver. Peter, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much, Luc. It's good to see you all again, and uh, welcome all to our uh, third uh, Learning from Leaders online. And it's a great privilege, as you say, uh, look to uh, welcome today a veteran, as he calls himself, from the Swiss watch industry. Uh, his official titles are non-executive chairman of the Swiss or the, the watch division, the whole watch division of LVMH. LVMH, of course, the um, uh, large company, uh, uh, luxury group, uh, Louis Vuitton, Moet NSC, and many others, as well as uh, the chairman of Hublot and Zenit, which are two very famous uh, Swiss watch um, brands. That is Jean-Claude Biver. Welcome uh, to you and, and thank you for joining us. All right. Now, can you hear me now? Absolutely perfect. Okay. So I wanted to say thank you for having me uh, on board. Thank you for giving me the privilege to talk to the students. Uh, it's my privilege and I hope it will also be a little bit the privilege of the students. So I'm really looking forward for this uh, great time we have one hour or two hours whatever uh, i can stay long i'm at home <laughs> i can have drinks i can have uh, hamburgers whatever so i can stay uh, the whole night but <laughs> we'll start uh, we'll start with an hour <laughs> okay. uh, excellent thank you uh, i'm gonna and i promise to to uh, to pay respects to you you're of course uh, a french speaker normally we would call you the mr biver but you kindly accepted i can call you jean claude Thank you so much for that. Uh, I want to dive right into it, uh, Jean-Claude, uh, because we're going to talk about your life and your career and all the amazing lessons uh, and adventures that you've had. Uh, but of course, we can't escape from the fact that we are still meeting at a time of crisis. Uh, the coronavirus is still keeping many of us locked down and is certainly impacting many industries, including also the luxury industry, of course, in which you're, uh, you've been active basically your whole career. And I just want to ask you, as so many brands are suffering, so many companies are suffering, if you were in charge of a, a luxury company today, uh, what would you be doing uh, as a reaction to the crisis? I would be extremely active, number one. Uh, usually in, cri in big crises like the one we have, people are in panic. And when they are in panic, they nearly don't move. And I would be extremely, extremely active. I would be moving like crazy, number one. That's as a general attitude. Number two, I would be extremely creative. I would invest a hell of a lot of money in the R&D the department. Because in the crisis, the R&D doesn't need the market. The crisis is the market, <laughs> is that right. people are not buying, people are confined. But when you cannot sell, then prepare the future. And the yeah. future is in innovation and in creativity. Number three, I would treat the customer. The first customer we have in our business is the retailer, the jewelry store. I have spoken probably to 400 jewelers already now through Zoom because in the crisis most of the, the sales people they stay at home and they lose contact with the distribution network and you should never lose contact because when you lose contact you have to recreate contact afterwards so and people will remember hey this guy he has called us seven times during the year of the crisis. He never forgot us. He was joking with us. 
He even has sent us chocolate and cheese. So yeah. I would really treat the distribution. So and, you'd, and, and, and you, last but not yeah, least, go ahead. I would, I would uh, promote all over my people, including my customers, that the Christ is my friend. It's not my enemy. Because if the Christ is my enemy, I have lost. How can you win against the Christ? So take the Christ with you. Say to the Christ, hey Christ, from now on we are together. Tell me, how can you help me? And in the Christ, there is huge energy. The problem of the Christ, the energy brings you down. So all you have to do is at a certain moment, take the energy and bring it up. It means in the Christ, there are opportunities. And these opportunities, you must take them with you. It's like in the Tour de France, this is a cycling uh, 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 concourse in French. Uh, when you are in the Alps, and it's very steep, it's not like in Holland, flat, it's steep, like in Alpe d'Huez, and suddenly you have wind, 80 kilometers wind in the face, you have snow, it's cold. Hey, that's the moment where you can take an advantage to accelerate of competitors. And I know, by the way, uh, Jean Claude, that, that you make that analogy uh, uh, not out of nowhere, eh? because I know that you are a, a, an avid cyclist. You like to, to to ride the bike, so you know what you're talking about. Um, and the other thing is, you know, you you take the, the words out of my mouth. Um, you say the crisis is also an opportunity. Uh, it's an opportunity because this is the moment when, if you can, you should accelerate and sort of make sure that the next phase is going to be better. Uh, you said you said we well, can do that, for example, by calling your uh, clients, uh, those jewelers who are probably now locked down and 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 not hearing from many people. Um, and you said you can also do that through through accelerating innovation. What what's the kind of innovation you would bring uh, today to a business if you were leading it? Oh, uh, the innovation it depends on your brand. If you are in a traditional brand, your innovation is different than when you are in an avant-garde brand. Yeah. Uh, the innovation in Hublot, I would really put a lot of, uh, uh, which we do, by the way, which we did, uh, a lot of investment into the development of materials, new materials, which give birth to new colors. Uh, in a watch, the material gives you the color. How can you make a, a, a watch that is red? Just because you, you have developed a red ceramic. You cannot paint the watch. You can paint yeah. a wonderful house. In the color. Is there, is there, is there and, and, and we're going to talk about that later on, but is there a specific um, lesson that you can learn from the crisis? If you run a watch division, uh, you know, we've seen, of course, many people going online on Zoom. That's a clear uh, innovation uh, when it comes to meetings or to conferences, but for a watch, what, what would the learning be or the innovation be uh, from a crisis like this one uh, for, the, for, for designing a watch? You know, uh, you, uh, you must think, what, how is the um, uh, psychology of people during a crisis? In the crisis, people will need love. <laughs> love <laughs> is really, an incredible, <laughs> uh, 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 how can I say? It's, it's, a, it's an antidote of the Christ. And what is love? Love is emotion. Love is colors. This is why we offer uh, ca uh, uh, color flowers to, to, for Mother's Day, etc. So I would work on seduce the customer through the emotion, not so much through technology. I would go more on the emotion because that's what people will need after the crisis. People will need emotion. People will need dreams again. People will need to see the future. People will need the colors. So we would work on that side more on the emotional side to seduce the customer, to make him tranquilize him, to make him happy, uh, to make him dream, that side of the R&D, I would emphasize. Yeah. And not so much on technology. 
And it's an extremely uh, interesting but counterintuitive insight, isn't it? Because right now, a lot of people, their first reaction would be to say, it's all about technology. And actually, you say, that's not quite right. It's, it's more about emotion. And I think that uh, for a lot of people, they will, they will agree with that assessment after you made it. Maybe one last question about it, and then we move on to your career lessons, because I think they're so inspiring. Um, I can already see a couple of people asking in the chat also, you know, what if you're in the situation that you have a store um, one of your clients and you've had to close your store for several months. And I know we all know examples like that, people that have been suffering because of course they haven't been able to, to make any money in the last couple of months. Is there a responsibility for, um, you know, somebody like, uh, you know, their suppliers, if they, if they have a little bit more of a buffer uh, to do something, is there, is there anything that we should do the one for the other to help each other out? And what does that translate to in terms of business uh, relations? Okay, to, to come back on uh, R&D with emotion and technology, uh, I would emphasize more now on the emotion, but also uh, we'll never forget the technology. You know, if I take this, this, this instrument, it's a phone. This phone is technology and it is design. And design is emotion. And today, if you would have colors, if you were a little, you know, that would be the right thing for the Christ. In the sure. Christ, you don't necessarily want black. Maybe you want rose or a light blue or with a heart or flowers, whatever. That was just to, the, to, to add. Yeah. To the, of course. Uh, what would I do if I would have a store? We have stores. We have hundred, more than 100 stores all over the world. So what did we do? Because I can give you a practical uh, answer of what we did. And uh, we did it mainly in China, in Hong Kong, in Taiwan, <clears throat> but also here in Switzerland. We have a customer, a customer base that are registered, we, uh, final customers, the doctor, an engineer, whatever. We have called these people and we said to these people, our store is closed, but for you, the store will be open. Only for you. The store is 200 square meters. You will be alone in the store. And we will pick you up. We will give you mask, gloves, everything. And the store is yours. And you can choose uh, uh, between 8 o'clock, 8 a.m. till midnight. And this, you can come with your kids, you can come with your wife, you can come with your cousin, with your brother. So we had the whole day, we had, I don't know, 10 customers because each one stayed nearly an hour. But only 10 customers, while usually we have 80 or 100. But at least these 10 customers, they will always remember that Hublot gave them the opportunity to come and to stay one or two hours and to be served like a king just for the customer. Yeah. We, in one day, we sold the watch for one million, for one million dollar in one day to one customer. He bought a one million dollar watch. So this is a typical strategy uh, <laughs> that, you can, that you can do that we did. It's not a, th a theory, it's yeah. what we did. And of course, you know, for business people and people that are in, in, in uh, stores, you know, that's what they do. They, they, uh, they're there for their clients. And so that's a very practical example. And I want to thank you for it. You know, Jean-Claude, shifting gears a little bit, you know, you are known as the man who saved the Swiss mechanical watch. And you've, of course, been an, an, an icon almost of uh, Switzerland for many, many years. But that's not where your story started, isn't it? I think you're from closer from where I am. Uh, which is to say from, uh, from uh, Luxembourg, isn't that right? Yes, I'm from Luxembourg. You are from Holland or Belgium? I'm from Belgium. Ah, from Belgium. Ah, I'm yeah. a friend of Eddie Merckx. That's fantastic. Um, I, I, I had a run with him, a few runs this summer uh, in July or August, together with him in the mountains. Uh, Eddie Merckx, for those of you who don't know, he's actually the one who uh, won the Tour de France five times. Jean-Claude, but so you came from uh, Luxembourg and at some point in your life, you must have made the decision to move to Switzerland. When, could you tell us when that was and why that was? Oh, it was not my fault. You know, my, my parents decided to move to Switzerland and to put the two kids into a boarding school in Switzerland. That's how I landed in Switzerland when I was 10 years old. Yeah. So it and was so you... my decision. It was my parents 
who thought that a boarding school in Switzerland would be good for my education. And it was very good for the education. And uh, I loved Switzerland so much and I developed my personality, my friends. So when uh, I had the opportunity to move back home, I said to my parents, I don't want to go home. Yeah. I want to stay in Switzerland. I want to go also now to the next level, which is the university. And I want to go to a Swiss university in the same city uh, where I was in the boarding school. And that's how I, I started uh, in Switzerland. And I loved it so much and I'm totally integrated. I have been now living in Switzerland 61 years. Uh, I am 71. Uh, 61 <laughs> years in Switzerland and I am Swiss. My yeah. Swiss. My it wife. takes a while to become Swiss. Uh, I think it's about 10 years. I know I'm at the beginning of that journey, not at the end. Uh, but Jean-Claude, so you, uh, you went to university in Switzerland, as, by the way, are, are many of our viewers. Um, and, and then afterwards, I'm sure you had the opportunity to say, well, I'll, I'll go and discover the world. And, and, and surely many people have done that, uh, that studied with you. But instead, you chose for a rather less gram glamorous future, didn't you? Because I think you joined quite soon after you graduated uh, a, a Swiss uh, company that was making watches. And instead of sending you all around the world to, to live a life of glitz and glamour, um, you learned how to, how to make watches. Isn't that right? Yes, you know, I had, um, I had a degree. I had the best degree, a school uh, that you can get, the highest. What is it? It's my passion. <laughs> if you are passionate, you don't need necessarily a diploma. <laughs> passion is so important. And passion is such a drive that except in, in certain <laughs> Uh, uh, if you want to become a doctor or like that, okay, you need. To, uh, but in, I, I studied business, so uh, uh, I had a passion. And I said, as I have a passion, I'm so lucky to have a passion. Let's go and stop studying and develop your passion. And then I had the chance to to uh, to go into a watch brand to be employed in a watch brand called Audemars Piguet. And there, the boss, the CEO, said to me, listen, you're going to join my company, but during one year, you will have no office, no phone line, no name cards, no marketing uh, uh, duties, no commercial duties, no traveling, no assistant, no nobody. And I said, but what will I get? He said, <laughs> you will get an education. You will be, during one year, you will work and uh, assist and learn at each degree of the production process. I said, what will, will I do? You will do nothing. You will just sit and look and listen. And slowly, slowly, you will learn. And you will learn the mentality of the people who are making the watches. You will learn... Uh, 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 what they like. You will, uh, you will learn where they live. You will sp play football with the team. I said, yeah. Oh. And I came back home and I said to my wife, what a shit. This guy is giving me half salary only and I have no business to do. I cannot travel. I have even no name card. I have no phone. I have no office. What do you, uh, shall I accept this? And we decided that I should accept it. And yeah. I accepted to, the work, to work during one year, <laughs> being paid half salary and doing just nothing, but assisting people, looking at people stupidly, what they were doing. Yeah. And, like the, and that was the biggest asset I ever got because I, I entered the world of making watches. Yeah the inside and which is which is really a a a moment when time almost stands still uh, yeah. it takes a long time to make a watch and of course it's it's done also in a valley in switzerland that is it is not the big metropolitan area not the the new york or switzerland it's uh it's a it's a village it's small villages it's village. where, where in people work in silence and it's cold and there's even uh, in in our days there was no there was no cinema there was just a church uh, yeah, uh, and the closest uh, cinema was uh, it was not so far away, but it was thirty kilometer drive. 
to go to uh, to see a movie. It must have been special to to see a movie then. But so, but so you. It, one of the lessons I think is that you know afterwards you did of course uh, become a, a traveler and a salesman and a, and the CEO even of several watch brands. But it all starts with a solid foundation, and and sometimes it's worthwhile investing that time in order to really get to know. Um, a product or, or uh, your, your industry. Now, um, of course, a couple of year, years later, uh, something quite disruptive, I think, happened in the watch industry. Switzerland was known for many years for its, for its uh, watches, for its mechanical watches. And then you had all in a sudden this, this disruptive innovation from Japan, which was the quartz watch. It was a new way of making watches. It was much cheaper and it really took the world of watches by storm, hard to imagine now for, for us as we live in the age of uh, uh, phones, et, et cetera. Um, but it really was a, a big change. And rather than saying, again, counterintuitively, you said rather than adopting that new technology and saying, this is the future, you actually said, I don't think that's right. I've seen how, how people make watches in this little village. And I think there's something very worthwhile in it. And I'm going to double down. And, and I think what you did then is even say, I'm going, I'm going to even buy one of these mechanical watch uh, brands. Isn't that right? And could you tell us a little bit more and, and why did you do that? You know, I, uh, when I was uh, uh, living in the commune, I was a hippie in 1960, from 67 to 71. We were reading uh, uh, Mao, we were reading Confucius, etc. Um, and Confucius said, only the dead fish swims in the sea and in the direction of the, of the stream. Room, of the stream. The fish that is alive goes against the stream or together with the stream and double the speed or left or right. And we interpreted this by saying, hey, when we enter the world of business, we will have to be careful always to be first, different, unique. Because when you are first, different, unique, you are not with the stream. You are a contrarian. Contrarian is the fish that goes up. The dead fish has no choice, goes with the stream. And this idea of being contrarian was one, I, was one of the reasons why I went into that direction with the mechanical. But there was a second uh, uh, reason. We knew, because we were not stupid, we knew that quartz watches are, are running with batteries. And a battery, uh, any watch with a battery, is a watch that one day, one day, will we'll be stopped. obsolete. Yeah. And we, and, but a mechanical watch that makes tick 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 can work 100 years, 200 years. Uh, Big Ben in London is still running and it's not electronic, it's mechanical. So we said, we, if we go reverse, contrarian, and we can promote eternity against obsolescence, who gonna win? Who competes eternity? Nobody. God. Yeah eventually. So we said we will enter a field where we will win against yeah. the courts. And number three, we also knew that a watch that is made with your fingers, with your hand, with your heritage, compared to a watch that is made with technology and machines and computers and robots, the difference is that whatever is made with your fingers can have a soul. What is made, what is machine made, has no soul. Right. So these three reasons, the soul, the eternity, and the contrarian, and the passion, of course, pushed us, bam, to go that direction. And you bought uh, a, a, a very old, I think maybe one of the oldest, or even the oldest Swiss brands in, in watchmaking, which was Blancpain if I'm not mistaken, and, and you really turn it around and made it the pride of the Swiss uh, watch industry. And by the way, you're, you're, you sell it so well, if, uh, if you were selling me one, I, I think if I had 
the money I would buy it. Uh, so I can see why you were very successful at that. And uh, you managed after a couple of years, you worked really hard on this. You, you said also, I'm, I'm Mr. 410, meaning that you get up at four in the morning and you stop working at 10 at night, um, which is of course very hard work. Uh, and you managed to make this a success story. And at the end of that success story, you did something remarkable again, which is to say, you sold the company. At that time, there was a new big behemoth in the Swiss uh, watch industry. It was Swiss watch, short Swatch, we all know it, of course, and you decided to uh, sell. This is one of those moments in life where you have to make a decision. Do I sell or do I keep my brand that I've worked on for such a long time? What made you decide uh, to sell? You know, just to come back quickly to working from uh, four to 10, from 4 a.m. to 10 p.m. This you can only do if you have a passion. If you have no passion, it's impossible to work like that. Passion makes you work <laughs> nearly 24 hours a day. Uh, Cristiano Ronaldo, football player, he, he trains like crazy. He never stops. That's right. When I, when I met him uh, uh, in Manchester United many, many years ago, uh, uh, um, he never went. He never wanted to go out of the stadium. You know, uh, he 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 was working, 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 working because the guy was totally crazy and passionate. He he didn't have necessarily more talent, but he had more passion. Yeah, but passion brings you to get up at four till ten uh, p.m. That was for sure. Now, what was the question again? Uh, <laughs> so after many years of... Uh, yeah, 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 I sold, yes. You sold. You know, in 1992 came a big um, uh, crisis. Um, uh, interest rates went up to 9% in Switzerland. In other countries, it was even more. 9%. I had made a deal, uh, a contract to buy... A manufacturer called Frederic Piguet, producing the movement. This deal was done for 20 million. And I had to execute myself on the 8th of June, 1992. And I signed this convention uh, in 1989. But in 1989, Interest were no... rates were at 4%. And when suddenly the interest rate grew, 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 went up, 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 I had a first, for the first time in my life, a panic. I was panicked. I said I will never be able to pay. And the banks were not so easy to handle. You know, <laughs> they had no, no big sympathy for me. And so uh, you had to make a choice. So and... I had to make a choice. Um, and because I was too young, too milled, uh, too weak, uh, I took the wrong decision. And I took the decision to sell. <laughs> uh, but it was a wrong decision. Yes, but in this wrong decision, many positive elements came. Because I sold to a big group called Swatch Group. I became member of the board. So I got another experience than being the boss of Little Blampa. Number two, I got the responsibility to handle Omega. I brought James Bond into Omega. I brought Sidney Crawford in Omega. And Omega was a huge brand. So I learned so much. So in a certain way, if I would not have sold, I would never have had so much experience. Yeah. I would never have seen the world in the same way. And thanks to this, I, when I left in, two, uh, in 2003, I was, was capable to buy Hublot. Yeah. If and, I would not have sold Blanca. I and that's be, sometimes uh, you, you can't predict the future, of course. And you might say at some point, if I look back, you know, that was a bad decision or that was not the right decision, but you don't, um, you don't 
stick with that moment. You say, you know, there is beauty also in taking another path than that the destiny path, and you still find opportunities and you still make the best of it. And you gave some examples, um, like for example, Omega, of course, uh, being a very famous watch brand. That's sort of a rite of passage if you're in uh, New York in the finance industry. You have to have an Omega. Um, so you have that experience of of working with a bigger group, working for different uh, watches for many years, learning from a, a leader, I think Nick Hayek, who, who led that uh, company. And then many years later, you said, I want to do it all again. I want to I wanna buy again another watch uh, brand. And you did that with Hublot. And, uh, and, and Hublot was a very different because of course, we don't know all these differences between watches if we're not experts. Uh, Blancpain was an, an, a classical watch. Well, yeah. Blancpain was, 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 was not, Blancpain had been sold and closed in 1959. And you revived? From 1959 till 1982, when I bought it, there was no activity. And yeah. when I bought it, there was nothing to buy except the name. The name. There was no, 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 no company, no manufacturer, no, uh, no uh, ventures, no people, no contracts, no collection, no distribution, nothing, just yeah. the name. From the ground up, you build it. So, but, but that one you build up on the idea of the classic mechanical yes, watch. Yes. Um, and Hublot, you took into a different direction. Of course, it's also a mechanical watch, yes. but it was much more founded on innovative uh, ways of making watches, innovative looks, and also a very distinctive uh, marketing strategy where you said, I'm going to target young people. I'm going to target, before the word was invented, influencers. Yes. Um, and, and the culture is going to go up from the influencers that are young and that may not be able to afford to watch to the real target audience, which are people that can afford that watch. Can you tell us a little bit more about that process and, and, and what that looked like? Yes, uh, the, uh, the, uh, we gave to Hublot uh, a very special message, which I called the art of fusion in the watchmaking uh, industry. And what is fusion in the watch industry? It's when you mix tradition and innovation. You know, uh, 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 till, we decide, till we developed Hublot, expensive watches, they were either in yellow gold, white gold, which is gold, or rosé gold, it's still gold, or platinum, or steel. So mostly, I can say 90% of the luxury watches were produced in five materials. In fact, rose gold, white gold, and yellow gold is still gold. So that's one material. Platinum is the second one, and steel the third one. So it was in three materials. And how many colors these three materials have? <laughs> yellow and white. So more or less than two colors. And we said, an expensive watch that retails, let's say, for $100,000 can also be made in carbon. Because carbon is the material that goes to Mars. Uh, and gold is the material of Tutankhamun. So what do you want? Do you want the grave of the pyramid of Tutankhamun who died 3,000 years ago? Or do you want the material that goes to Mars? Young people will tell you, I want to go to Mars. I can go <laughs> later to the pyramids <laughs> and to see Tutankhamun. So we have, we said, we're going to fuse the carbon that is the future and the old technique of making watches of the movement. You know, you can see, I don't know. Ah. Yes, yeah, yeah, we can see ah, it. Tak, 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 tak. That's beautiful. So we said, that is the fusion. We will marry tomorrow and yesterday and bring them yeah. together. And that would, that this story would apply and would be understood by young people. Old people like me, they would not understand how can you make such an expensive watch and it's even not in gold my goodness so what we in, so the fusion was really the message that made Hublot successful and so different because now we have watches in red ceramic the same red color than uh, ferrari we are partner with ferrari we have been working eight years to develop a red 
as a ceramic because ceramic is heated at 2000 degrees. It's very and, difficult. And red at a certain moment, this red pigmentation is burning at 2000 and becomes a Bordeaux or a little bit rose, but not the right red of Ferrari. Yeah. We worked eight years to develop this red color. And, now, and you managed to do it. Uh, and exactly. And now you can buy a red watch for $100,000, put it on your wrist, and you have something extraordinary. Yeah. And people who are old, people who are traditional, say, oh no, can I have it also in gold? But I would never wear it in gold because gold is, you know, it doesn't appeal so much to, to modernity, to our today lifestyle. Yeah. So Hublot became a kind of lifestyle watch. Uh, a luxury lifestyle watch, especially that we went, uh, we said we're going to follow the customers wherever the customer goes. If Jay-Z is somebody who is influent, we must make a watch with Jay-Z. If uh, Virgil Abloh is making a watch, uh, uh, is influent, we must be with uh, Virgil, uh, etc. We went to, to uh, uh, um, my, um, uh, uh, Garrick's yeah, and it's something that you did, didn't you? Because you, you did go to those influencers avant la lettre, uh, and you also applied uh, that same innovative approach to uh, your marketing techniques. Uh, to give a few examples, uh, you know, you went to, uh, to Las Vegas and you said, here's a world championship boxing match going on. What's the best way to, to brand our watch? Well, we're going to put the name of the watch on the, uh, uh, the shorts of the boxer. And, and the same thing you did with uh, football, with soccer where you said, you know, are we going to buy a shirt sponsoring? No. Are we going to buy the bannering on the, on the, on the stadium? No. Uh, why don't we put uh, uh, our promotion or our brand on the, um, uh, on the, on the replacement uh, clock that shows uh, when uh, people leave the field? So you had really some innovative ideas on the marketing front as well. How do you get such ideas? I mean, like, why would you do that you were of course very successful but it's a it's a it's a very peculiar strategy you can only do it if you think out of the box <laughs> you can only do it if you refuse to do the same as others you see why did we go into boxing because in boxing you never never ever had a luxury product or watch on the short of the the boxer and we said, we will be first, different, and unique. We went to football. Never, ever before did you have a luxury uh, brand presenting the referee board uh, uh, in football. Because people say, ah, football is popular. Come on, football is also popular, but not only popular. Boxing is also popular, but not only popular. And if you go to Las Vegas and you want to see the boxing game, the 10 first rows, the seats cost between $50,000, one seat, and the, 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 to 5000 And then you have the seats that cost only 2000 1000 etc. So we, when you are obsessed to never think like others, when you are obsessed to be different, when you're obsessed to be first, when you are obsessed to be unique, then suddenly you think out of the box. And when you're out of the box, the whole world is there, open for you. When you're in the box, you are like a bird that is in his box and you cannot get out. Yeah. So people must learn to think out of the box. But to think out of the box, you need courage. The courage to eventually be wrong. Because when you do like others, <laughs> when you copy, Eventually, you will not be wrong. That's if right. You copy the right product. But you will not be first, different, unique, and you will be just a follower. We said we won't be leader. So we accept eventually to be wrong. We accept that some people say, this watch, can, how can luxury go into boxing? We said, okay, you don't understand. You are not my customer. I have enough customers who understand. Yeah. So you must have the courage to be wrong. And the courage to be wrong is the most important element that an entrepreneur must have. Most of the people are afraid to be wrong. So they take no risk or they go mainstream. 
That's right. Or they follow the past, or they follow a competitor. Then they think they cannot be wrong. Yeah, and, you will not be wrong, but you will be nobody. So I prefer yeah. somebody. Eventually, I'm wrong. But if you are wrong 20, 30 times, it doesn't matter because seven times on 10, you are right. That's right. And, and you prove, of course, that you were right. Um, I want to, as you say, we could go on forever uh, uh, having this conversation. I had a few more questions for you, but I want to bring in one of our students that, that has a question. It's Dara uh, Parikh. Uh, who is studying at EU Barcelona. And she has a question, she's from originally from India, and she has a question uh, for you on, I think, what we've been talking about and the idea of, um, of uh, the luxury brands and idols. Dara, go ahead. Hello. Hello, Dara. Am I audible? Yes, we can yes, hear you. Yes, we can hear you, and we can even see you. <laughs> Thank you. I would like to ask you, like when you started your journey, who were your ideals? Who were your inspiration from whom you, you got that passion to go in this field? Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, my, 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 <laughs> my inspiration and my drive comes from my heart. Passion is a kind of love. <laughs> uh, and love you cannot explain. <laughs> it's not rational. So most of my energy, most of my ideas are coming from my passion. Now, of course, I always had a mentor and I always had one example to follow. And my mentor, I had three, by the way, but one of my mentor was called Gerald Genta. He was a very famous uh, designer. And one day I was with him and uh, in the train and the train was passing along a lake and there were uh, 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 some, uh, some mountains behind the lake and some trees. And I asked him a, a question. I said, Mr. Genta, I, I, can I ask you, uh, Maestro, can I marry the color blue and green? And he answered, oh my goodness, what a stupid question. And I said, well, a stupid question, why? This question is stupid because you should never ask me. And I said, but who shall I ask? You should ask God. And I said, but who is God? I don't believe in God. He said, you don't need to believe in God. God is planet Earth. God is nature. And God has created this. And this is why we call sometimes God the creator. And the creator, you must ask him. I said, how do I ask God, which I don't know? And how do I ask the creator, which I also don't know? He said, but the creator has created. Just look what he did. And he said to me, look the lake, blue. Look the trees, green. That's the answer. From now on, every time you have a question for anything, ask nature, ask planet. And planet is our mother because she has given birth to us. Without God, without planet, we will not be living. So all your questions can be answered by planet, by, our, by, the, by nature. Yeah, and it's a- uh, It's the basement of my, of my, my, my thinking. It, it's a fascinating answer, and I think it sort of uh, uh, goes to a, a question that we also have from Gala, uh, Gala Garcia, if, if we could maybe go to her, because you talk about nature as an inspiration and as a guide. Of course, many people are also concerned that uh, we are destroying nature and that there's a problem with sustainability. Um, so maybe can we ask Gala to come on and, uh, and ask you your question about that? Hello. Good afternoon, Hello. Mr. Weaver. Thank you for, for having us. Um, I would like to ask you a question about sustainability because as high-end consumers are now becoming more ethically uh, and sustainably driven, how do you think the luxury industry is adapting to this trend? Are there any changes? Oh, the industry, the industry has to adapt if they will not <laughs> they, they will want to stay alive. We already have adapted. 
uh, in a certain way with leather goods. There are certain leather goods that are forbidden. Crocodile is forbidden in California. You cannot sell anymore. You cannot produce anymore. Uh, we have to have certifications for certain uh, leathers that this leather comes from a, a, a normal origin. Um, we have rules for gold or diamond. We cannot buy dime, blood diamonds, you know, we must check uh, how the diamonds are, are, are produced. Uh, so there is a conscious that we, luxury, we, will, we should be leaders because uh, in the luxury industry, you can eventually uh, 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 put in your price the cost, the supplement cost of uh, sustainability, which you cannot necessarily when you sell a t-shirt for $3. So uh, we must be an example. We must be at the forefront of uh, 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 sustainability. That's the, that is a mission of luxury. And after the virus, this mission will become stronger and stronger. And we must now, the luxury industry, take the lead of sustainability. Yeah, and it's something that uh, a lot of people are asking also in uh, in the chat. Uh, a lot of questions that I hope we can get to later. But um, uh, you know, it's a question: What is the the role of the technology of the uh, luxury industry, uh, not just on sustainability, but also uh, during this crisis? Um, and 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 many uh, questions of of that type. Um, I also heard some more questions about your your mentor and and some examples for you. And then we have Alexandra on the line, Alexandra Bruchanska. Uh, who is based, I think, in uh, in the Ukraine, uh, and she had a question about uh, about your um, uh, about your choices, and and perhaps if you uh, uh, if you've not only made good choices but also bad choices. Why don't we listen to the question from Ale Alexandra? Good afternoon, Mr. Bever. Uh, yes, I have one question to you. If you could start uh, all over again from the beginning, what would you do differently? Oh, I would do. 100% the same, nothing different, because all my mistakes, all my failures, all my errors have helped me to develop myself, have helped me to come further. As I said before, I saw Bonpin, it was certainly a mistake, but thanks to this mistake, I improved. Thanks to this mistake, I went further, I became more wise. I had another, so uh, if I should die, which I will certainly, and God would tell me, do you want to go back and to live a second time? I would say, no, thank you very much. What? You don't want? But you know, all the people I ask, they say yes. How come you say no? Oh God, sorry, I would say. Listen, no, I'm, I, I want to live a second time, but one condition. Give me 100% the same life with no changes, with all my suffering, with all my defeats, with all my, my betrayals, with everything that went wrong. Because at the end, all this helped me to grow. Yeah, it's, it's, it's incredible, right? Because even if you, uh, if you make right choices or wrong choices, you stay at the end of the day, uh, I wouldn't change a, a thing. Uh, I want to, uh, we're going to get to a few more questions because you're inspiring so many viewers. Uh, the questions keep piling in. Uh, before we get to those, I want to call on Harsirat uh, Kaur, uh, who's uh, based in uh, Barcelona, who's originally from India. And she wants to ask you about uh, startups and if you have any uh, tips for them, I think. Uh, why don't you go ahead, Harsirat? Uh, hi, Mr. Beaver. Nice to see you here. Uh, my question is, like, as I have a passion for luxurious brands and fashion and industry, like, I would like to open a luxurious brand. So I want to ask you, like, how we can start a luxurious brand? Like, what should be focused? What should be the guidelines? Like, what should we do and what should we not? Like, what are the pros and cons? Thank you. If, the question is, if, if you want to start a luxurious brand? Yes. Yeah. What are the do's and don'ts? How you do it? So you cannot do it <laughs> until you have experience. So the first thing you must do, you must join any brand uh, 
to learn, to listen, to look at, and to grow your experience. Because the world is so difficult today that the experience is what we really need. Diplomas and uh, many people are studying, many people get diplomas, but the experience, that's, that's the real value of somebody. Um, you know, Einstein said, uh, the experience is more valuable than knowledge because the knowledge is, everybody can read it, everybody can learn it. <laughs> experience, not everybody. <laughs> you, can, you can be very wise, but no experience. So experience is what you need. So don't go into any field, don't start anything without experience. Yeah. You would say, yes, Mr. Biva, you are right, but there are so many startups. Yes, but the startup, most of them are technology startups or product driven startups. And that's different because if you are a brilliant engineer and you invent a new, a new phone, okay, then you, you are in the technology. But in the luxury, it's mostly experience. Yeah, and it's, it's something that I think uh, people in other uh, uh, companies in Switzerland and the watch industry understand because if I'm not mistaken, one of the taglines of one of the competitors of yours is to, uh, to break the rules, you must first master them. And that goes back to that idea of uh, experience. Nevertheless, uh, you know, sometimes you do have to take risks, right? Because you said, I, I bet big on the red ceramic Eight years of development, incredible amount of time, incredible amount, amount of investments, no doubt. Uh, so there's a question from uh, uh, Margarita Chvetko, uh, uh, who, who is doing a master in luxury at the EU, and she asks, what's the biggest risk, uh, Mr. Biver, uh, that you've taken in your life or in your career? And, and how, how do you learn to embrace risk with all the, uh, you know, the negative downsides that come with it, of course? The biggest risk is not to listen to other people. The biggest risk is not to learn. The biggest risk is not to have doubts. <laughs> uh, you must develop doubts. The doubt is a double check. The doubt is a friend. You must be clear that nothing can be achieved alone. So you must build a team or you must have partners. But it's not necessary to have partners if you don't listen to them. You must learn to listen. You must learn to learn. You must learn to learn. In school, normally you don't learn to learn. You're just learning. The teacher is giving you every day the drink of knowledge. Right. And now I got knowledge. <laughs> but now I'm not more in school. Who is giving me this? I have to find it myself which I call, you have to learn to learn. Yeah. So learning to learn, uh, listening to other people, having doubts and getting up at two o'clock in the morning and said, shit, am I right? Am I right? Will I fail or not? The doubt is your friend because he will help you to double check. So these are attitudes. And last but not least, you must have the courage to fail. And if you fail, you must see it positively and say, I failed, but I learned so much. I will not repeat this mistake. And how many mistakes can you make in a lifetime professionally? Maybe 100 or 200. And in, in your first stage, in the first years of in, when you are in, in, in business, do mistakes when you are young. Don't yeah takes when you are old <laughs> because when you are young you have so many years after but if i do a mistake now at 71 how many years do i have left to make a correction not so many because I, i'm close to 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 say bye bye yeah you see these are the elements you should you should embrace so you know if you look at your own career of course you talked about it already a little bit um you know you took a little bit of a risk when you started your own uh, company uh, the first one 
but it was not that big of a risk because you paid 20,000 francs, you said, for that company. And you sold it afterwards, I think, for around 50 billion francs, which is incredible. Um, but then the second time around, I suppose you did take more risks, didn't you, with, with Hublot and, and the expensive um, bets that you, you made then. Could you tell us a little bit about how, how that journey went and, and how you managed in a much shorter amount of time to get to success despite investing so much uh, money and, and making such risky bets? You're right. Uh, 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 the, the risk with Blancpain was small because we bought the brand for 22,000 Swiss francs. And the risk was also small because I didn't take a salary from Blancpain. I was working during the night at the post office. So I had the salary from the post office. Uh, working from 8 uh, p.m. to 5 a.m. every day. And then I go to work at, uh, at, uh, in my company. Uh, so I had, we had nearly no salaries to pay. Uh, we were renting an old farmhouse that we were paying 300 euro per month. Uh, so the risk was very small. Yeah. Because we had nothing to risk. <laughs> uh, uh, the, the second one with, uh, with, Lopa, uh, with Hublot was naturally a little bit bigger because when we bought the company, the company was already doing 26 million turnover, which is nothing compared to 14 years later. Now we are making 700 million. So we went to, from 26 to 700 in 14 years. Uh, we went from 2.6 million losses to more than 100 million profit in 14 years uh, and and we took relatively little risk because we never borrowed money yeah. and we said if we need three employees let's take only one and ask him to work like three and to give him double salary <laughs> <laughs> that's i'm, I'm sure that's a... when you need three people only take two <laughs> Uh, only take one and give him double salary. He will work like three <laughs> easily. So yeah. uh, um, I, I can see from, from the way you express it, that's, that's, that's half a joke, maybe not fully a joke, but half a joke. And, and of course, uh, uh, half a joke. Uh, yes. half a joke. Half a joke. Um, you know, I, I, before we close, I do want to ask you a couple of questions about, uh, you know, again, the impact of the coronavirus. I mean, like we're getting a lot of questions from people like Bidyut Chudhuri, who asks, how badly will the elite watch manufacturing industry be affected uh, post the corona crisis? And, and also other people that are asking, you know, what would you advise, uh, you know, the industry right now as it goes through this crisis? You talked, of course, about the immediate response uh, by having the shops open for individual clients, but longer term, no doubt, there will be other challenges. And of course, as always, there are technological uh, challenges on the, on the horizon as well. You know, to give this answer, I, I, I should be an epidemiologist, I should be a doctor, I should, because the answer is, doesn't come from the economy. The answer doesn't come from the finance. The answer comes from how can we stop this virus? How can, when will we get the vaccine? Uh, when will we get uh, uh, yeah. medicine to fight against? That's, of course, the immediate response of, or the immediate solution, if you will. You know, there's long-term factors like technology, and the question has been perennial. You know, how come the Swiss watch industry has been so resilient in spite of all the innovation? And has the moment finally arrived in which technology wins and the mechanical watch loses? No, technology will not win uh, uh, in a luxury, expensive watch because technology if you buy i say anything now a great watch i have two of them called uh, uh, I, um, uh, apple watch you know the apple watch i have two apple watches um, <clears throat> but it costs 600 dollars which is not nothing it's a lot of money but it's 600 dollars and then i have a watch here on my wrist that retails for $180,000. How can this watch with $180,000, which tells nothing, just what time it is, be a competitor or, be, or have competition from an Apple Watch? That is a great watch, costs 500. But the Apple Watch, in as, as much as I like it, I, I already had three, I now I have two left one day will become obsolete. And 
it's just a product of technology. This is a product of art. It's a piece of art. It's like a painting of Picasso or a picture of, Pica of the painting. You can have the picture and frame it and put it in your, in your dining room. Or you can have the original one. The difference is relatively small. Yeah. <laughs> but the difference in prices and the pictures. And that explains why. Original. That, of course, so, exp a, 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 a technological watch cannot compete. A watch that has a soul, a watch that uh, has a history, a watch that has eternity. Yeah, and that explains, of course, uh, why some watches are more expensive than others is because they're not uh, just uh, uh, methods to tell the time, but they're pieces of, of art. You know, there's, there's someone who asks also, you know, how come then, if it is a piece of art, how come then uh, that, that watches lose value the moment that they get off the shelf? I mean, if they're truly pieces of art, then you should see them go up in value over time, shouldn't you? But all the, all the, uh, all the um, uh, art, sculptures, uh, paintings, we only know those where the value goes up. But there are so many painters in the world. How many of them will grow in value in, fu in future? Not so many. And it's the same for, for in watches. Probably we have 10, 15, 20 watch brands where you can nearly sleep and be sure that in 20 years the value has gone up. But there are also other brands because they produce too many or because the quality is not sufficient or because the distribution network is not so clean. There are many reasons which might not get the same value as time goes on than others. Yeah. Uh, that is very logical. Not every painting uh, uh, will take value. But not a, not a watch from Mr. Biver. Uh, that only goes up in value, I think. Um, I want to, because we've always hit time, I want to... I want it. <laughs> <laughs> I want to ask you one uh, last question. It comes from Daniela Delgado. I think it's a nice one to end. Uh, she studies in Barcelona. And she asked, uh, how do you keep yourself motivated? And I'm sure it's a question to you, but it's a question that we ask ourselves. Um, uh, many of us are asking ourselves, what do you do when you feel down or when you're losing motivation? And, and maybe your answer can give us some motivation as well. I keep motivation because of my heart. Passion is love. Passion comes from here. And from here, it goes into the blood and it goes into the body everywhere. And once you are in passion, you know, then you are in eternity because love is eternal. And passion is eternal. Yeah. How do you find your passion? Don't lose passion. Where do you get that from? Because you, you were locked up in a Swiss village, you know, when you were in your early 20s, and you found passion in, in that uh, situation. But, but, but us, where, where do we find? We're, we're locked up in our homes right now. Where do we find passion? You know, I, 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 said, I said to uh, one student one day, have you seen there they were tul tulips? on the table. I said, have you seen these tulips? And the student said, yes. And then I said, have you seen that there are three colors of tulips? There was a yellow, a white, and, a, and a, a red one. He said, yes. Have you asked yourself a question about these tulips? The guy said, no. Then maybe you can explain to me why some tulips are red and why others are yellow. He said, I don't know. I said, but if you don't know, haven't you been curious? Haven't you made the research on Google to understand why the same flower one time comes in red, one time in yellow, one time in, in, in white? Oh no, I said, if you have a lack of curiosity, you will never go into the details. And when you go in the details, looking and trying to understand why this color are appearing, how come you will enter the world of marvelous biology and you might become a passionate about tulips and your girlfriend comes from Argentina and you might go to Argentina and you buy a piece of land 
and you will grow tulips and you will make the best tulips in the world because you will develop a special color that the Dutch tulips have not and you will make a fortune and you will live uh, happy with your passion. Yeah. So, but if you have no curiosity, if you are not asking questions, your passion will not come because not everybody is born with a passion. I was also not born with a passion for watchers. I developed it. Yeah. I, and I developed it because I wanted to develop it. And I wanted to find in the watch my steam machine, which I loved when I was a little boy. And I said, if, if uh, as a little boy, I had a toy, which is called a steam machine. Now as an adult, which, how is my toy now? It cannot be the same steam machine than when I was a baby. So the watch is probably a steam machine with a little bit of imagination. Yeah. The watch, the, the, from the tool of the baby, which was a steam machine, has grown and has become a watch. And the little baby has grown and has become an entrepreneur. And I now have my toy and my toy is my watch. So I will develop a, a passion for watches. That's what I said to myself. Yeah. In order to get the 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 uh, to go into your passion, I was reading, I was asking questions, and people say, "Ah, oh, you like it," and and slowly, slowly, I got infused by passion. Yeah, no, it's true, and, and and I think it also answers another question that we received, which is, "What is the number one characteristic to have when entering the industry?" I think it's quite obvious that your answer is passion. Yes. Um, so. <laughs> So we have that question out of the way. You know, we, we could go on for, for a little while longer. I do want to uh, let uh, people know that uh, are, are attending that if, of course, you have to go at six, we understand that we've passed that mark. Uh, so we, we show some compassion. Um, but uh, but the questions keep piling in, uh, uh, Jean-Claude. Um, and, and maybe one more that I'd like to highlight if we can is, you know, one person is asking, of course, passion, but uh, you also learn from people, don't you? And and of all the, of all the people that you've known and worked with, and there's quite a few, uh, Nick Hayek at, at Swatch or Bernard Arnault at the LVMH, and I'm sure there's many more, and you've met so many people, also the influences you worked with. What is uh, some of uh, the most uh, impressive people or the, the people that you've that maybe have had the largest impact on you as a person or as a professional? Simplicity authenticity, humble. The more you see successful people in sport, in business, in art, the more you will notice that they are humble. The more you will notice that they are always, always ready to listen. The more you will notice that they will take time to explain to you. The more you will notice that they need others to help. So, this is the key. Many people, when they get successful, they forget that they should help others. They forget to listen to others. They forget to be humble. They become arrogant. They become yeah. self-sufficient. Is they there anyone in particular that you, you say like th that person really uh, embodies those characteristics that we can we look at? Pardon me? Is there anyone in particular that we can uh, we can look at that you know? I mean, for many people, I'm sure it will be you. Uh, but for you, who who's or some other people? Mr. Hayek, uh, M.G. Uh, Nicola uh, G. Hayek, the Papa, not Nick Hayek. I mean, it both had the name Nick. The Papa, the name was Nick George Hayek, M.G. Hayek, the Papa Hayek. You could call him at six o'clock in the morning at midnight. He would answer the phone. He would call you on Sunday. He would always, and if you would ask him, can I come to your office? He would not say, no, today I have meeting. Look with my secretary. He would say immediately, wait one second. Yes, come in 10 minutes. It, the office would always be open. He would always be ready to help. He would always be, and this is the simplicity. This, this you know, he has remained a simple man. Yeah. All, all, all <laughs> very successful, very powerful, strong character, yes, but simplicity, authenticity, and humble. Yeah, and, and, and maybe uh, one, one last question that we want to ask you, because you talked so much about passion and how important it's been for you in your career. Now, of course, even if you do find your passion, you have to find a way to convert it uh, into something. Um, that's and the so, biggest difficulty. That's the biggest difficulty. That is the biggest challenge. 
uh, no, the biggest challenge is to get to have a passion. The second biggest challenge is to transform your daily job into passion. That's, yeah. that's difficult, I know. That's, uh, uh, you know, life is not easy. And we are talking now from, a, the, you know, when you have a passion and you can work every day in your passion, but that's, that's, that's the best that can happen. Did you, did you know when you bought that first company for 20,000 uh, to 22,000 francs, did you have any indication beyond the fact that by then it was a passion of yours, the mechanical watch, yes. that yes, there was, was a future in it? It was. And that's why we were successful, because we transmitted this passion. The way we talked about our watch was totally different from others. And, you know, and even my own watchmakers, where in average we had in those days, 80 to 100 screws per watch. And I said to each watchmaker, when, when you have uh, 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 your watch, you have your watch, and when you, you, you go with the screwdriver on, the, on the, uh, the screw, when you come to the end, leave a trace of love. It means say something positive in your head. I love my job, or I love my boss, or I love my partner. I, I love my, 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 my watch. And if you have 80 times you think positive love, and when you close the, the watch case, the box, then you have inside traces of love, and this inside gets out. Yeah. And, and that's really, you know, then, then we must end. It's, uh, uh, you know, everything, uh, all beautiful things must end. And so we must end this, this conversation. I do want to uh, ask you this. It's an, a question from Aidana As Asanova. And she asked, if you look back now, what's the one thing that you're most proud of, of all the things that you've uh, done in, in, uh, in the industry? I would say my kids. <laughs> my kids are better than me. And they all have a passion for, for watches. And I listen a lot to them. <laughs> I learn a lot from them. And they have helped me to stay young and to stay connected. Uh, when they talked to me uh, 10 years ago about Virgil Abloh, I didn't know who he was. Uh, <laughs> when they were telling me about Martin Garrix, I had no idea who was Martin Garrix. Um, <laughs> you've learned from them. And of course, you've, yes. you've been able to... They merge those things. Yes. And one day we were eating at, uh, at Nobu in uh, London. And my youngest son, he was in those days uh, 12 years old. He said, Papa, here, look, this blonde girl, her name is Cara Delevingne. You should take her as an ambassador because she is the future uh, <laughs> uh, for, ambassador, for women ambassadors. Yeah. And I said, what, who is she? What the name, what is the name? I have no idea. And then I came back home, I checked, and I heard that uh, Burberry would, uh, would eventually make uh, a campaign with her. And I connected with her and we I took her on board. But without my son, I would never have known in those days who was Cara Delevingne. I would know it now, but now it's late. And so now we, and, my, and of my course, kids have been my best <laughs> teachers. Really. Yeah, they've been your best teacher. So uh, to end then, uh, really, uh, Jean-Claude, what's, uh, what's next for Jean-Claude Biver? Uh, next is easy. Next is to give back. When you have received so much, I must give back. I cannot leave in keeping all this for me. I must give back. Yeah. And that I think would be, that's my last mission. It's not the easiest one, <laughs> for sure. It's probably the most difficult one. But I have to succeed in giving back. Yeah. And it's something I think there's not a better note to end on because I think if you've done anything today, it is to give back. And we see it from all the people that have joined us, enormous amounts of gratitude for all the lessons that you've learned of your taught us. And I'm sure that uh, we could go on forever, but we'll leave that for next time. Jean-Claude Biver, I want to thank you so much for your inspiring uh, testimony, for your talk, for all your advice, and really for just being with us uh, during this hour and, and 15 minutes. Thank you, Jean-Claude. Thank you to all of you. Thank you very much.
Mr. Beaver, thank you very much for this inspiring moment. Thank you very much, Peter, for facilitating this moment as well. Um, you have been sharing your passion and, and your vision with our students and everybody feels really energized after this speech. So thank you very much. Thank you, Luke. Thank you very much. A virtual What's applause. For you. Uh, May 28 for our students, Elena Edblom, CEO and president, president of Epiroc, will be joining us for the next Learning from Leaders series. Looking forward to this, uh, to this session as well. Stay safe, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us.